Okay, at this point we're going to wrap up MOSFETs and we're going to see them used in devices we see all, all around us all the time, but which we haven't covered before. Uh, devices such as power amplifiers, which changes MOSFET design. Uh, flash memory, which also changes MOSFET design. And then towards the end of this we'll also talk about uh, how you put together a microchip in terms of integrating all the uh, transistors as well. And so here's the topics we're going to cover. Let's go ahead and dive in. And so the first slide here is, is just so you are aware. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I never gave you an equivalent circuit model for a MOSFET, and you can see it here. It's, it's pretty simple. You know, here's your gate, here's your drain, here's your source, here's your n-type region for the source, n-type region for the drain, here's your p-type substrate. This is an n-MOS device, just like this one here where I want to make an n-type channel. And just like a MOSFET, if I have gate voltage and I have voltage from uh, across the source to drain, then that voltage can turn into a current by the transconductance of the MOSFET, giving me current flow from source to drain. And then you look at this, the rest of this stuff is what helps you when you look at the high frequency aspects of this. You have capacitances between the gate and various regions of interest. You have capacitance between the gate and the source, which you see here, because this is my source region and I've got capacitance between the gate and the drain and um, in here I've got capacitance with the source end of the channel and source uh, or the drain end of the channel. Why do I have two of these? Well because I basically remember as I put voltage across a MOSFET I can get pinch off and so in this case I'm getting pinch off in this direction right so here's my channel my channel shape will be shaped like this and so that'll change my capacitance as well and so you they, simp they simplify it by saying, okay, we'll take the average of this capacitance and this capacitance here because of the pinch-off effect, and we'll get the results we need that way. And then you have resistances, junction capacitances for depletions and regions and things like that. So it, it's pretty straightforward, nothing you haven't seen, seen before, basically. So let's go on to uh, power MOSFETs first. So MOSFETs are increasingly used for power switching applications, but with our design we have here, we would not use this for power switching. Why not? Well, if you look at how the device operates, remember, I get inversion <clears throat> under the oxide here. And so almost all of my carriers are in a super thin sheet right here against the oxide surface. Like here's my oxide, this is distance into the semiconductor, right against the oxide there. Remember, my concentration goes up exponentially with the band bending. So practically all of them are in this thin sheet here. So if I get a ton of current flow through this thing, I'm going to get a ton of heat to generate under this oxide because of this super thin resistor and it basically will blow the oxide level right off of this thing. So it's very easy to fry a MOSFET because you, base, you essentially have this perfect thin film resistor that heats up when you run a lot of current through it which could blow the oxide right off of this thing. So if we want to basically create a, mo mo a power type MOSFET, we need to make some design changes. So for power switching applications, you need to do two things. This is very important. You need to reduce the channel length and spread the current out very quickly. So how could you do this? Well, look what they've done here. This is a power mount MOSFET design where the source is here, the drain is at the back side, and the gate's on top. And so if you look at this device, you have PNP. You have, no matter what you do with source and drain voltage, you're going to have a reverse bias PN junction, right? Just like a regular MOSFET. But to turn this device on, what you do is you put a gate voltage, and all you have to do is invert this region right here, this very thin P region. So this is your channel. It's now much shorter. We said we needed to do that, right? And so my resistor is reduced substantially in terms of its length, which reduces its resistance and then allows me to get more current flow through this device. Furthermore, I have less heat, total heat dissipa dissipation because here's the only place where I have a significant amount of resistance. And you can see what they do here. The reason why they put the drain in the back is they can spread the current out very quickly because if you spread the current out, there's less heat dissipation concentrated in one area. And so you get n-type, 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 and current 
flowing from the source drain. In this case, it's current in this direction, but it's electrons moving in this direction. Okay. So if I look at a, uh, a top view of what this would look like, you'd have basically here's your, your gate metals. Okay, so here's my gate from the top. And then around that, I have this source region here. You can see there's the source region, and then there's the P region there. Okay, and so underneath all this, I'd have the N type region there. You notice these things have rounded corners. The reason why is that you don't want high field points. Anytime you have a sharp edge, that gives you high field points, that gives you higher current concentration and can cause the chip to fail. And so if you want to get tens of amps of current through this thing, you'll take a ton of these things and you'll run them in parallel. And so this would basically, in a, in a package device, all of these individual MOSFETs could be essentially one FET with one gate connection to all of these, all the sources connected, and one connection out the backside at the drain. So these power MOSFETs have replaced BJTs in power switching applications. You don't really use BJTs that often anymore in power switching, but BJTs are still great in digital in discrete circuit design, um, as we've seen in electronics and how we could do BJTs, and BJTs dominate in RF applications where you need amplification, such as wireless communications. Here's some alternate designs for a power MOSFET. It should be pretty obvious how this works as well. And so if you see, here's my source. It has contacted this n-type region here, and here's an n-type region here, an n-type substrate. So what's blocking me is I've got a PN junction here and here, right? So one of them is going to be reverse biased. And so basically, you need you get inversion here and here. And so they made an n-type region, a p-type region, and then they get the inversion under the oxide right here, because here's my gate metal. So there's where they get the inversion to get n-type n-type, 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 and get electrons to flow through this device. Same thing here, different type of trench device. This is what you might call a trench MOSFET. I just basically need to get this p-type region here to be n-type, then I'll have n-type and n-type, and that's all I'm trying to do here is put voltage on the gate, cross this oxide to get current flow through there. Now, again, up until the 70s and 80s, BJT was the choice device for discrete and integrated circuit, but, but CMOS dominates in integrated circuits, right? But again, BJT is still do, uh, very well utilized for demanding analog circuits, such as RF and wireless systems. And so what they've done recently is they said, well, okay, take the advantages of MOSFETs and combine them with BJTs using a by CMOS process, and you'll get some advantages. Well, what might those advantages be? Well, it's very simple. If you remember what's great about a MOSFET, it has a very high input impedance, meaning that at the gate, you've got a capacitor, right? And so it takes no current once you've biased the gate to maintain the gate in a current switching, uh, switching state. And then the BJT portion of this, so here is the gate part of a MOSFET. The BJT portion you see here has that great high output current and ability to basically amplify in things like RF circuits and wireless systems. And so you, again, you get the high input impedance of the gate of a MOSFET where you just charge up a capacitor, there's no DC current needed, with the high output current and excellent RF amplification characteristics of a, of a BJT. Let's take a look at what this, uh, what this would look like in, de in the device design. Um, before we do that, actually, I want to show you one more thing. This is a um, by CMOS circuits that are developed by by uh, by a Freescale Semiconductor. This is what they call a silicon germanium RF by CMOS chip. And so you can read some of the advantages and applications they list here, but this is what it would actually look like, and you can purchase these devices. So I'll show you two ways you could do this. Here's one way you could do it, and let's see if you can figure out how you can bias it. So here I see I have a MOSFET and here I have a BJT, okay? Here's my MOSFET, here's my source and my drain for the MOSFET, here's the gate, here's my BJT which is a P plus N P BJT, so I want current in this direction. So let's figure out how we might bias this thing. Well the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my BJT for, for normal forward operation. So I'm going to say maybe I'll put, I'll put 4 volts, 4 volts up here on the uh, emitter of the BJT. 
okay? And now let's make this electrical ground back here. So I'll make this uh, zero volts out here, okay? So now I've got the BJT set up that I could inject holes from the emitter out here to the collector. The problem here is I've got this base, right? I've got to inject current into the base. So how am I going to do that? Well, I will do that through my MOSFET. And so what I'm going to do here is if I've got zero volts here and I need to turn the MOSFET on, and this is an NMOS device, meaning I want negative charge here, then I want positive charge on the gate. So let's say I'll put on this, um, let's say I'll put three volts on here. Three volts turns this on on the gate. It gets me an N-type channel here, okay? And so now I can get current flow of electrons in this direction into the base. Remember, if it's a BJT, I need to inject electrons into the base, and every time I add an electron, then holes can zip across the base, right? So, the question, how do I get electrons in here? Well, that means I want to have current flow in this direction, right? I want to have current flow in this direction. So if I want to have current flow in this direction, then an electron's going this way, then that means I'm going to have to have a negative voltage there. So let's put that negative voltage there. So let's call this, um, we'll call this minus one volt, okay? Now, at this point though, I've got the ability to inject electrons into the base, but I've made a slight mistake here because if you look out here, if I have minus one volts on this right here, okay, and I've got zero volts out here, then I'm going to forward bias this PN junction and get current flow in this direction. So the last thing I'm going to do to, to resolve this is I'm going to come back to my, uh, to my collector here. I'm going to make this minus two volts, okay? So now I've got the BJT set up for normal forward operation. But in addition, I've got this device where this is a reverse bias PN junction, so I don't have DC current flow through this PN junction. Okay? And if that if this was too much voltage for the gate, if this is, you know, this is a net voltage of five volts to turn that on, I could always lower the gate voltage I need to turn this thing on. But for now, I'll assume a threshold voltage of five volts was needed to turn it on, and this is efficient enough to get this device to work. So for this device, if it has a transconductance, let's say the device on the left side has a transconductance of 1 times 10 to the minus 3 Siemens or amps per volt and the device on the right has an amplification factor of 100 what's the change in current at terminal 4 when V2 here is changed by one, changed by 1 volt? Well that's pretty easy to do if I know that at V2 I've got this transconductance okay so then I have V2 is 1 volt I multiply that by my transconductance, which is amps per volt, right? And I will get out, as a result, one milliamp, right? Well, if I'm feeding one milliamp, then into the base. So if I have one if I V2 gives me one milliamp of current into the base here, and I know my amplification factor is 100, then I know from my BJT the current that's being emitted is therefore 100 milliamps. It's a very simple calculation of how I could give you parameters for this device and you could figure out the current flows and the biases. Now here's another way to make a bi CMOS device and this is pretty elegant um, if we look at this thing. Now I know everything's not shaded in terms of the colors but uh, you can see everything's clearly labeled here. Here's an N plus region here and here. Here's P type material. Here's N type material. This is oxide and this is the metal. And so, how's this device work? Okay. Well, this is my collector and source. So, collector for the BJT portion, source for the uh, MOSFET version. Same over here. So, this is also collector source. Here's my gate and here's my emitter. Okay. And so look at how this device works. It's really simple to make and it's quite elegant. Okay? And so what you'll see here is that if I put voltage on the gate here, adequate to get inversion of this P-type material to N-type material, I can get electrons then to inject here. Okay? Why would I want electrons injecting here? Well, if you look here, this is a PNP BJT, right? 
And so if I get electrons in the base of the BJT, I can also get current flow through the BJT. And so what I want to do, I'll try to draw this up here, is I want to get electrons injected here. I'll draw a little bit better than they did here because I don't think their, their description is great in terms of how they drew it. I'll put the electrons there. And then once I've done that, I can then get current flow of holes through this BJT from p-type region to p-type region. So I've got the MOSFET action here under this oxide controlling current injection into the base and then I've got BJT action. So this is another way to do the device of the previous uh, slide where you basically again have a MOSFET input stage, high input impedance, very low DC current, no DC current required to give you a high output, high, <coughs> high output current. Okay, that's it for this first part. Take a break and make sure you are solid on the start items.